Okay, so now it's recording. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to lecture 12, part one of the course Quantum Theory in a nutshell. Um, as you probably saw yesterday, I uploaded the third and final assignment of this course. So you can find it in the website of the course. And you have to hand in on Saturday. And of course, um, if you have questions about it, do not hesitate to write an email to me or to ask uh, to the tutors. And moreover, as just, uh, no, so it's, uh, it was written. Okay, let me make this, uh, these two uh, announcements. First, uh, the problem number one has a typo that I'll fix just during the break of this lecture. So I will update the, the exercise sheet of the website. And you have to hand in on Saturday. So it's, um, it's uh, uh, yeah, on Saturday, not Monday, as, as it was written before. Um, uh, so sorry about these uh, typos. Um, I'll fix during the break. And um, so um, what we are doing now in this course is um, trying to collect a set of rules and a set of mathematical structure that will be the foundations of quantum mechanics, if you wish. And um, I'm trying to teach you how to extract physical quantities from this framework, okay? Um, so I understand that this is, uh, this can be very weird in the beginning. So I do expect that um, when you start practicing and when you start to get your hands dirty on reproducing calculations, you might get confused with the language, you might get confused with what you have to compute, but this is part of um, learning quantum mechanics. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a topic that involves uh, a too complicated mathematical structure, at, at least for the level that we are learning, but it requires a lot of uh, new ways of thinking about how to describe a physical system. Um, I also hope Hello. that... Hi. Um, I have questions. Okay. Uh, I will just finish the, let's say, the initial speech and then you can ask. Um, so, uh, what we are going to do um, today and in the following days is to construct the final objects that you need in order to describe the evolution of a quantum system. And by the end, I hope to uh, uh, work with you uh, the example, the, a simple example, which is the harmonic oscillator, the quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, so now uh, I will open for questions. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, it's you, sir. Okay. Um, okay. Can you go back to slide 16? Yeah, of course. Um, Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes, the last equation on slide 16. Why is it written like this? I know the conjugate, you write it as uh, U and EJ, right? Uh, so you mean this quantity here? Yes, yes. I can just exchange the order of E and U, and the price I pay for that is the removal of this conjugate. So I can replace this guy by this guy. Okay. Yeah, I understand, but why you change the position also? Is it the same? Yeah, it is the same. So these are numbers, so they commute, okay? So I can, this is a number, this is a number, and this is a number. I can reshuffle the order of these, uh, of these numbers, they commute. Okay. And Again, I am, slide 18. Okay, just to, to finish that, I'm doing this because you see that will appear this structure, which is the 
E J bra times the E J sorry the E J cat times the E J bra and this will be the projector. That's why I'm writing this way yes. because then then you can see the projector. Okay. Okay. Uh, slide eighteen. Yes. Yes, uh, for you say C one is cosine theta and C two is sine theta. I mean, I don't understand why we use theta here. Uh, and okay. equated to the C one and C two. Okay, so um, what I'm, I'm doing here is the following. I am telling you that a polarization vector can be expanded in these bases. Okay the basis E1 and E2. And then I'm just reminding you that when we started discussing the polarization of light, I wrote that the vector or the state associated with a polarization in the direction theta is given by this expression here, okay? And I'm just saying that this vector can be written as a sum of two vectors, okay? It can be written as a sum of the vector E1 with the vector E2. But I have to multiply E1 and E2 by uh, some suitable coefficients in order to get this vector. And those coefficients are, which I call here C1 and C2, they must be cosine theta and sine theta to describe this state here. Okay? So I'm just I'm just okay. I'm just giving specific values for C1 and C2 when I want to describe a specific state, which is the state theta. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. You are welcome. So um, I see that there are other questions in the chat. Um, Mahmoud uh, said, I did not get the answer for the last exercise. Uh, which exercise are you referring to, Mahmoud? Uh, hello. Hi. Slide, slide 17. Okay. Yeah, ah. so for the outer product. Yes. Uh, I didn't okay. get a scalar, pro, a scalar number multiplied by another kit. No, okay. So if you take this, uh, uh, object here, which is represented by this two by two matrix. And if you act with this on a vector, then you are not going to get uh, a scalar. You're going to get another vector. So what, what I, I asked you to verify with this exercise is if this property here is true. So this property says the following. Um, the matrix AB multiplied by the state U is given by, you first take the scalar product between B and U, and then you multiply by the vector A. I'm just asking you to verify that this is true, provided that you use this representation here. Uh, what I was doing yesterday, I multiplied uh, the outer product A, uh, kit A pra B by the kit vector for U. Yes. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't understand the answer, the so, final, my final answer. Let's assume that you have a cat U with entries U1 and U2, okay? So I'm just defining um, this cat. And now I want to compute the following. I want to compute this outer product acting on the cat U, okay? So here I'm telling you that this outer product is given by this matrix. So I can simply take this matrix here and multiply by this vector. 
okay? So when I take this matrix, I will have A1, B1 star, A2, B1 star, A1, B2 star, A2, B2 star, and I multiply that by U1 and U2, okay? So just by looking at this, you can see that I will have the first row multiplying the vector and the second row multiplying the vector. So the result of this thing will be a column vector with some entry here and some entry here. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. So, and what I'm saying is that the entries you can just read off from, from the matrix multiplication. So let me call this, um, let me use a better uh, notation. So let me call this as, um, I don't know, alpha one and alpha two, okay? So I can compute who is alpha one. Alpha one will be the product of this number with U1 plus the product of this number with this number, okay? So alpha one will be A1, B1 star times U1 plus A1, B2 star U2. And you can work out the same thing for alpha two, and I'm going to find an expression for alpha for alpha two. Right? Yes. Good. So what I'm saying now is that this calculation here that you are performing should give the same result if instead of acting with this matrix on the vector U, you did the following. Instead of doing this first and then multiplying by this, you did the following. You did bra B, scalar U, times A, okay? So you see, I'm just, I'm just saying that this operation should be equal to this operation. But let's see what is the result of the scalar product between B and U, okay? So the bra B will have the following structure. It will be a row vector, with entries B, one star, and B, two star. And the cat U will be the column vector U1 and U2, okay? So this scalar product will give me a number, okay? And this number is uh, B1 star times U1, B2 star times U2. So this will be B1 star U1 plus B2 star U2. And now I say multiply this number by the cat A. But the cat A is this vector here. And now I just have to multiply this vector by this scalar. Multiplying a vector by a scalar means take the first component of the vector and multiply by this. Take the second component of the vector and multiply by this. So if you multiply now the first component A1 by this number, this is the same as just multiplying this by A1. Now, and this would be alpha 1. Okay, so compare this result with this result. This here is A1, B1 star, U1. Look at the first term, B1 star, U1 times A1, which is exactly what appears here. Now you compute the second one, B2 star, U2 times A1. Here you see A1, B2 star, and U2. So you see that they agree. So either performing the operation in this form or in this form, you get the same answers. 
that's that was the purpose of the exercise all right thank you did you want did you understand yes yes okay thank you you're welcome okay so let me clean up a bit this mess Okay, um, then there is another question by Prince. Uh, can you tell us how to find the AJ? So AJ, you mean uh, uh, this, this, uh, so where it appears? Uh, so it appears here, right? So AJ are the possible values that you can measure given an observable A. Um, hopefully today I'll, I'll answer your question, how you extract the values AJ, okay? So this is something that we did not see yet. Um, then there is uh, another question. It's good that you're asking questions. You should use this opportunity to, to ask. <laughs> Uh, Grace uh, said, for the circular polarization, we moved from a circular polarizer to a linear polarizer. If we move the other way around, that is from a linear to a circular polarizer, will it change anything? No, it will not, okay? Um, you can just work it out, work out this. Um, um, explicitly okay uh so there is um another question so please could you explain the expansion on the left hand side uh last slide you mean uh, this slide that i were uh, uh discussing so which expansion you want me to to explain uh, this here, okay, so here, Hello. Oh, yeah, yeah. tell me, hi. The other one, where you have a um, bracket open, then you have um, the cat of A into bra of B, into alpha, cat of U, beta. This? The down one. This one? Yes. Okay, okay, so um, here I defined what is the outer product, how the outer product acts on a state vector. And here, what I'm saying to you is that, so here you are acting on a single vector, and here you are acting with an outer product on a sum of vectors. And what I'm saying is that the outer product of two vectors is a linear operator. So it means that this guy can just enter the parenthesis, goes through the number, which is alpha, and act on u. So this will give this result here. And the same happens for the second term. So this is a, you can distribute this guy here and here. So this guy will act uh, on the second one and it will give beta times the action of a, b on v, right? And then here, I'm just factoring out the cat a appears here and here, am I putting, and I am putting this out of the bracket, okay? So I'm just telling that this guy can enter the parenthesis and distribute over the different vectors. And although this might seem silly, it is not, I mean, it's not true that all operators that you can construct are linear operators. This, is this, uh, 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 does this answer the question? Okay, good. Um, then Prince uh, say, what about EJ? We are also going to learn how to compute EJ. So uh, we don't know yet given um, uh, an observable, we don't know yet what are the values that you can measure out of this observable and what is the 
set of vectors that once you measure the observable A, you're going to get the value AJ with 100% of confidence if you are in a state EJ. We don't know how to compute those states and those numbers AJ yet. We are going to learn that. Okay. What about you? Um, oh, so far, uh, I'm just using you as a generic state to make my statement. But um, U is just a generic state. So assume that you want to describe a quantum system, and this quantum system is in a state that you don't know, and then you just call it U, okay? It's just a gener general name for, for a state. Okay? Okay, you're welcome. More questions? I think it's important that we are on the same page. So if you have more questions, please ask. Okay, so if you don't... Uh, I have okay. one question. Okay, go ahead. Um, in your notes, you made mention of um, linear polar... polar li uh, <laughs> polar in linear polarization. polarization. Yeah. So okay. I want to know, um, so um, if I have um, the linear part, um, the form is it only cause theta sine theta does it or there's more to it and the um, normalization part is it the only thing i have to consider for the linear part if i want if to you, tell if, if a, a state is linear if you have a photon that is in a state of linear polarization then they stay in a given direction theta then the state that describes this um uh, I'm going too far, I think. Uh, then the state um, um, that will describe uh, this vector is completely given by this expression. It's simply cosine theta and sine theta. It doesn't mean that, you, that this is unique in the sense that you can change bases, okay? You can express a vector with different coordinates if you change your bases. Okay. So in that case, there's no general way of writing it. Well, in this basis where I'm using this vector, um, which represents the um, polarization in the direction where theta is zero, and this is the polarization in the direction that theta is pi over two, then this is the unique way up to global phases. Okay. Because you can always multiply your vector by a global phase. Um, so I have, there are two uh, questions. Grace uh, asks to briefly explain circular polarization. Yes. So um, um, just let me just try to, to be uh, short on that because uh, the important part here is not uh, that you understand everything about circular polarization, but that you have just a, a, a rough idea what this means. So when you have an electromagnetic wave, um, you have oscillating electric field, okay? So your electric field is a vector that oscillates uh, uh, as time flows. Um, but of course, the direction of the electric field can change uh, also. And in particular, uh, you can change direction and the size, the amplitude of the electric field. So it can be really something that oscillates with some size and then it gets smaller and then it's get, it gets bigger again and so on, okay? So the purpose of the polarizers um, essentially is to select a specific component of your electric field. In particular, linear polarizers will filter the one direction of oscillation. 
So if your electric field is oscillating like crazy, the linear polarizer will select just one direction where your electric field will oscillate along. Okay. However, so when 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 the electromagnetic wave crosses the polarizer, the electric field will be oscillating in this very specific and well-defined direction. Um, however, you can also have a polarizer that will filter the electric field in such a way that it will oscillate with the same amplitude, but the direction of the electric field will rotate as time flows. So it's something that oscillates and also rotates, okay? So this is what a circular polarizer does for you. Um, of course, you can rotate uh, the electric field cl clockwise or uh, counterclockwise. And that's why we say that you can uh, have uh, uh, polariz circular polarization to the left and to the right. But um, in the end, the physical picture that you have to, to keep in mind is that this polarizer will make your electric field oscillate with the same amplitude and will rotate uh, with time. Okay? Is that uh, picture clear to you? Hello, sir. Hi. Okay, so I have a question. Suppose we are in these three dimensions. We are. Sorry, the, can you repeat the, the beginning of the question? Saying that, suppose we are in this three dimension. Yes. The wave is moving, is propagating on a Z axis where it has a component on the X axis and the Y axis. So when it meets with a cyclic polarizer, so the final component is take those again the two parts of X and Y or it should be right a one component? No. So uh, uh, the electric field, if your wave propagates along the Z direction, your electric field will be a vector on the plane X, Y. And the polarizer will select a direction that um, will be essentially a specific direction that lies on this plane X, Y, but it does not need to be the direction of x and the, or the direction of y. These are just the specific directions that are given by these vectors that I wrote here. But in principle, you're going to have a linear combination of uh, x and y. It means that the resulting wave will be just formed by two components which are orthogonal. Yes. So. A, a vector, so uh, although you are talking about the, the propagation of a wave in three dimensions, the electric field is confined to two dimensions. So it, it can be represented as a sum or a linear combination of two vectors. So you just need two vectors to describe this field. And, um, and therefore, um, you can, as I mean, in two, dim two uh, uh, dimensional Euclidean space, you can just write this as the sum of two orthogonal vectors with appropriate coefficients. So you can write it as the sum of a vector uh, uh, that represents the polarization in the direction that is aligned to the vertical axis, plus uh, some coefficients times the vector that represents the polarization in the horizontal direction, okay? Which forms nine, 90 degrees okay. with the vertical axis. Is that clear? Well, uh, let me go back to the chat. So the exercise, you just work it out. Wouldn't the left hand side give us a, a column vector while the right hand side a row vector? 
No, I mean, uh, if you have that in a, in a vector equation, then you're wrong. You cannot have that when you have an equation that uh, relates to vectors. If on one side you have a vector that is a, a column vector, then on the other side you must have a column vector as well. So look at this expression here. This is cat bra. So this will give, as we saw, a two by two matrix. Okay. And then you multiply a two by two matrix by a column vector. So the result of multiplying a two by two matrix by a, a matrix uh, uh, that is a column vector, in fact, that is two times one. So two, two, so this, this is good. You, you can only multiply matrices and vectors if these numbers agree. And the result will be a two times one uh, matrix, which is nothing but a column vector, okay? Um, and here, I mean, you can also see that from this type of analysis that a cat is a column vector. So A will be a two times one matrix, while B will be a row vector. So it's a one times two vector. So these numbers agree, and therefore the result will be a two by two matrix. So if I have a two by two matrix and I multiply by a column vector, then the result will be a column vector. Um, now let's see this expression. I have bra times a cat. So I have a bra. A bra is a one times two matrix and a cat is a two times one matrix. So these numbers agree and the result will be a one by one matrix. One by one matrix is nothing but just a number. So you have a number times a column vector. A column vector is, so you have a number, one times one, times a column vector, which is, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, in this case, it's, it's uh, um, <laughs> you, you, cannot write, you cannot do this analysis. You just have to multiply a number by a column vector, which by definition is a column vector, where you multiply each component by this is scalar, okay? So this is a column vector and this is a column vector. Is that clear to you, Eugene? Okay, so um, let, let me go step by step and you answer step by step, okay? So do you agree that this uh, uh, outer product gives to me a two by two matrix? Okay, I have a two by two matrix times a vector, a column vector. So I will have a two by two matrix which has four entries times a column vector, which has two entries. So I will multiply this row by the vector, by the vector here. This will give to me a component in the result. And I'll have to multiply this row by this vector, which will give me another component. And this will give a column vector. So do you agree that the left-hand side is a column vector? Good. Now I have to multiply uh, this number by this vector. So B times U is a row vector times a column vector. So when I take this row and multiply by this column, I'll get a number, right? So I have a number times a vector. So if you have a number times a vector, A1, A2, so this is a number and this is a column vector, this will give to you the vector alpha A1, alpha A2, which 
is also a column vector. Is that clear? So you see that this is a column vector, but that this is also a column vector. Okay, good. Um, let me erase these things. Oh, I erased things that I should not. Okay, very good. Um, let me see more questions. Please, what influences the choice of a global phase? Nothing. So a global phase is absolutely unphysical. So you can multiply your state by a global phase just for convenience, because sometimes you can kill one of the components, kill in the sense of trivializing it uh, by multiplying by a global phase. But it, I mean, there is no uh, prescription for using global phases. They are unphysical and therefore you just multiply if, if you want. Uh, there is a question by John that I did not understand actually. Why is that we mostly consider counterclockwise case in circular polarization? I mean, we consider both. Um, there is nothing special about the counterclockwise. Okay. Um, are there more questions? I'm, I'm happy to answer. But uh, just to know. So if this is not the case, then I will continue with the with the topics. Um, okay, let me just uh, go back. Yeah, so. Yesterday, we closed the session by introducing the so-called projectors or projection operators, which I denoted by big pi. And what we have seen was that, so you can construct for a given vector space, you can construct the projectors by taking the vectors that compose a basis of this vector space and just take the outer product of these uh, vectors, okay? This is how you construct the projector, for, for the projector uh, in the jf direction, for instance. And if you take all the projection operators in a given um, vector space and sum over all of them, so here I'm summing over the projector operators, and I have two because I'm working with a two-dimensional uh, vector space, then uh, what I will get will be the sum of the outer product of ej, ej, going from j equals one to two. And what I said is that this sum will give you the identity. So we work it out explicitly, um, pi one, in this basis, so E1 will be the column vector one zero, and the bra associated to that will be the row vector one zero. When you multiply these two vectors, you get this matrix, which is one zero zero one, sorry, one zero zero zero. And you can do the same with pi two, where the vector E2 is zero one. So now if you construct the matrix uh, that is generated out of the outer product between E2 and E2, you get this two by two matrix, which is zero, 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 one. Now I can just, you know, take this expression here and check whether the sum of these two matrices will give to me the identity. And when you sum pi one with pi two, you sum the first entry of this matrix with the first entry of this matrix, the second entry with the second entry, and so on and so forth. So what you get in the end is just the matrix one, zero, zero, one, 
which is nothing but the identity in the space of two by two matrices, okay? So this is an explicit check of this relation here. And as I said, we call this a resolution of the identity. And this is very important. We, we use that all the time, okay? So if I know all the projectors of my vector space, I can write the identity in this vector space, namely the operator that acts on a vector and gives me the same vector. I can write this identity um, as the sum of projectors, okay? And we are going to use that to write um, um, explicit expressions for the operators that we use in quantum mechanics, okay? So now we go to the topic of matrices, which I call matrices, but this is just a way of explicitly uh, uh, represent an operator in quantum mechanics. So you see that a projector, I call it an operator, and this means that this is a matrix, okay? A state is a vector. So operators are objects that will act on states, which are vectors, okay? Okay, so let me start with an operator A hat. Every time that I'm talking about an operator, I will put a hat on top of it. This is just to keep clear that this is not a number, this is an operator. So you cannot take this object and commute with everybody and so on, because this is an operator. So you can think in practice as being a matrix and you know that matrices typically do not commute. So if you multiply a matrix A by a matrix B and do the, 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 the different order B times A, typically the result will be different, okay? So be careful with that because operators do not commute. And this is the crucial thing about quantum mechanics, okay? So, an operator, I will write as a hat, and I see that there is something in the chat, let me see. So are plus and minus also operators? No, plus and minus, so you mean plus and minus, those are states, okay? Those are column vectors. But of course, they are vectors that also cover the two-dimensional vector space. So I can write projectors by writing things like that. So this is a projector and this is a projector, okay? And uh, what I'm saying is that this guy here and this guy here, those are operators, okay? Okay, good. Okay, so let me return to the matrix or to the operator A hat. So I have an operator, okay, A. So um, I'm going to do a trivial thing. So assume that you have an operator A. It is true that this operator A is the same as the identity times A, right? So if I take a matrix A and I multiply it by the identity from the left, this will give me the same matrix A, right? But it's also true that if I multiply the matrix from, from the right, so if I multiply the identity here, this will not change the result as well. So A can be written as identity times A times identity. It's like I can write the number three as being one 
times three times one. This is still <laughs> this is still three. Okay. So I'm doing the same with a matrix. I'm writing the matrix A as identity times matrix times identity. This is just a trivial statement. But now we know how to represent the identity as the sum of projectors. So I can replace this identity by the sum over i equals to 1 to 2. And then I write here the butterfly. So I'm just exchanging this identity by this expression here, which, as we learned, is a way of writing the identity. OK? So if this is true, then I can just replace this identity by this sum. And I can do the same with the second identity. I can write it as the sum over j equals to 1 to 2, ej times ej. OK? So this is what I did here. I just wrote a as identity times a times identity. And I replaced the first identity by the sum which is one, and I replace the second identity here by this sum, okay? So I'm just writing A, the operator A, in a difficult fashion, right? I'm just writing it as identity times A times identity, and then I'm substituting the identities by these sums of projectors, okay? But now, look, I can, so this operator is acting on this guy, and this bra is also acting on this matrix. So if I collect uh, the action of this bra, the action of the matrix and, and the, the cat here, I will define an object which is essentially the I will call it, uh, people call it often, the sandwich between E, I, A, and E, J. So this is exactly what I have here. And I can pull out the sum to here, OK? Because this is a linear operator, so I can enter with it in the sum. So what I'm doing here, I'm just calling E, I, A, E, J as i sorry as a i j i'm just giving a name to that and therefore what remains is just the double sum because i have this sum and this sum so i have the double sum the this cat that i did not do anything this cat is here then i write the object that i just defined a i j which is given by this sandwich here times the bra ej, which is here, OK? So I'm just writing the matrix i hat as this very complicated object here, OK? Good. So let me just clean a bit. Um, OK, so you have to be careful with that because uh, you see that, so Mahmoud asked, why can't we use just one summation? So I can write just a single symbol provided that I write i, j, 1 to 2. I need two different labels, i and j, OK? Because if, if you see, when i, takes the value 1, j can take the value 2. So you need two different sums to write these things. Um, but of course, you can collapse this double sum in just one symbol like that. But still, this represents a double sum. Okay, You cannot just write um, um, sum 
E I E I, and then you plug E I E I here because this is not true. What is true is that the identity is equal to the sum of these two guys, but you cannot start putting a bunch of bras and cats here. Okay? I'm just copying this expression and pasting here, copying this expression and pasting here. But I have to use different labels i and j because if i use i here as well i can get confused right because i mean the sum here is performed over these two guys and the sum here is performed over these two guys so if i use the same label i don't know if i have to sum over these and these or if i have to sum separately so this removes all the ambiguities on the sum so every time you have you want to write an independent sum in an expression, use different labels for different sums. Otherwise, you can get, I mean, you can make a, a mistake. So, this is a, an identity, and this is an identity. I'm just using two, ident two different identities, and in order to find a resolution for each of one, I'm just using the sum here and this sum here. Okay? Good. Hello. Uh, yeah? Yeah, please, I mean, can we get the situation whereby the resolution will give us zero? Sorry, can we get the situation? Can there be a situation whereby um, the resolution will give us um, zero? No, I mean, this is, this is uh, so the, the claim is that, or the statement is that, uh, yeah. this sum gives the identity, not zero. Okay. So, there is no, I mean, I'm saying that if you collect all the projectors and sum over them, you necessarily get the identity. This is not up to... Um, some conditions. This is a mathematical statement. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, we can now uh, look at this expression, and you see that a i j is this expression here. Let's look to this expression. So I have uh, an operator here that acts on a vector. So what happens when I act with an operator on a vector? I get another vector, right? So a hat acting on ej is a vector itself, and then I multiply it by the bra ei. So if I have a bra multiplying a cat, then this will give me a scalar, okay? So aij is a number, is a scalar. And here I have if this is a number, I can just put it everywhere that I, I want here. So I can, in particular, put this AIJ in front of everybody, and then I have the cat EI times the bra EJ, okay? This is an outer product, all right? So EI cat times EJ bra is an outer product, and therefore, this will give me a matrix E I times the bra E J. Okay, so this is a matrix that for every entry of the matrix, I have to multiply it by A I J. So if you, if you now write E1 as being 1, 0 and E2 as being 0, 1, and work out explicitly this expression here, you are going to get that a hat, namely, um, um, this object that you started with, is, at the end of the day, this matrix here. Okay? So, you start with this, you just write the cat E i, the bra e j, and sum over i's and j's, and you get that a hat is given by this expression. 
So it is a two by two matrix where the entries of this matrix, the, this matrix is given by those numbers that we defined here. So the first entry of this matrix will be A11. But what is A11? Is E1 A hat E1. A12 will be E1 A hat E2 and so on and so forth. You have to compute all these matrix elements. This is called, this sandwich is called the matrix elements of the operator A, okay? So what we are seeing here is that an operator A, a hat has a matrix representation, a two by two matrix representation, where each of the entries of the matrix is nothing but this sandwich here. The sandwich is between the bra of the vector, of one of the vectors of the basis, uh, the operator and the cat of, which corresponds to one of the vectors of the basis. So that's how you extract the matrix elements of your operator, okay? Okay, so um, I think I will stop for the break and then we come back. I will continue elaborating on that because I want to tell you what are the good properties that an operator has to have in order to be a quantity that we can measure, okay? In order to be an observable, okay? So uh, we come back in 10 minutes. Uh, thank you for your attention and I see you soon.